study through the book of Acts. This is the Acts of the Holy Spirit. We will eventually get to Acts chapter 2, uh, verses uh, 22 and following. Just, uh, 22 through 36 is what I plan to do today. So, um, so let's just do a little brief review about where we are at. I'm going to be teaching on the empowered disciple, how a disciple is transformed for ministry by the power of the Holy Spirit. And these are people who have the person of the Holy Spirit, but have not yet released themselves to the power of the Holy Spirit. So uh, we're going to be talking about Peter specifically today. And well, how did the Holy Spirit make a change in his life? And it was radical. But just leading up to that, uh, we have... Let's see if I can get this thing. Ah, yes. Well, <laughs> it, went, it went quite... We're not going to... I don't think we're going to have it here at Easton, so we may have to have you go back and do that. But, oh, I've gone all the way back there. So I had, I, one of these days I'll have to learn to get control here, but it's not happening today. Um, the next... Go to the, <laughs> I hate to tell you that. Go to the next slide there. So... Um, Anyway, so Luke records um, and starts with the fact that Jesus spent 40 days with his disciples after the resurrection. So, and it says literally in chapter 1, with many convincing proofs. I mean, how many days would you have to see a resurrected Jesus to feel comfortable? He's really resurrected and he's real. I think if it was me, I would touch him every day. Just to make sure. I mean, you're not a ghost. <laughs> you really are who you say you are, and you're really risen from the dead. The disciples were then left, and they went to the upper room where they were to wait, and they ended up waiting for 10 days. Now, in my opinion, that's a, long day, that's a lot of days to wait. But they were waiting there. And Jesus didn't tell them how many days to wait, but just to stay in this room and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And as we begin in chapter 2, indeed... On early in the morning, well, not that early, about 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, the room literally began to have manifestations. Weird things happened inside the room, not outside the room, inside the room. There was a wind that stirred up, and there was little pieces or little fireballs on the top of everyone's head. And they began to speak with other tongues. And the noise was not just within the room, it actually went outside so that people began to gather from all over Jerusalem. They were probably there at, um, you know, McDonald's or at uh, IHOP eating breakfast and they all piled out to see what was going on because of this great disturbance in the city. So they gathered around and that's where Peter stood up and he says, I want to explain to you what's happened today. And he got up and began to speak and he preached out of Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32, and we talked about that a few weeks, a couple of weeks ago. And so uh, we do have this little video, so I'll let, so if you want to listen to the Word of God or follow in your Bible, we will watch Peter preach, if we can get that thing to run there. So uh, can we do that? Having all kinds of technological challenges. Can we get the video? Oh, there we go. Thank you for getting that. <clears throat> so the question we want to ask here as we see uh, and begin this passage in uh, verse 22. And uh, I have to get to verse. Men of Israel, listen to this. Now, he starts out that way and we say, well, who is this speaker? Now, for some of you are looking, well, we know who the speaker is. It's James Brolin. Well, that's not what I mean. That may be who's up there, but uh, uh, we want to, uh, there we go. Who is, this, who is this guy? And if you were, just came out and you saw this guy speaking and all this noise that happened, wouldn't you ask the question, well, who is this guy? Because you've got to realize this guy, now we know him as Peter, Nobody in the city probably knew who he was. He wasn't a significant pe person. In fact, let's review who he, who he was. Was this the man, the man who's speaking so boldly here, wasn't not the man who was an uneducated fisherman, those who did know him? Is this the same man to whom Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan? Is this the same man who claimed that no matter what, he would stand with Jesus... And when the time came, he not only fled, but later when he followed Jesus, he denied even knowing him three times. Who is this guy? Is it really the same guy? And um, 
So we ask that question. Now the answer to all of those questions is yes. That's who the guy is. That is the same guy. So the question is what made this guy become like this? How could he stand up so boldly and speak before his, all his countrymen? Do you have an idea of how many people were probably gathered? It's not accurate on the movie. Does anyone know and remember how many people were saved after he spoke this message? It was 3,000. So you know at least 3,000 people were in the crowd. Has anyone in here ever spoken to a crowd of 3,000 people? Let me see your hands. No one's here. All right. I haven't spoken to 3,000, but close to 2,500. And that was one of my first sermons. Can you imagine? I was asked to speak at All Roberts University in front of the students, in front of the faculty, and everyone else. Can, can you imagine how I felt? Anyone like to suggest? It was more than butterflies. I had horses jumping inside of my stomach, so to speak. So here this guy gets up in front of thousands of people and speaks articulately, powerfully, like, who is this guy? Let me ask you a question. Now, you don't have to put your hands up on this. How many of you in this room, if I were to tell you one day you will stand in front of a group of people, maybe 100, 200, maybe 500, and speak boldly about Jesus to them? Can you imagine yourself doing that? Some of you in here can. If you talked to me when I was in college or, and certainly in high school, you said, can you ever imagine yourself standing up and doing thus and so? I would say, not on your life. My father was a great preacher and and uh, over the years led many, many people to Christ, had large crusades, has worked alongside of Billy Graham, and, um, and I always looked at him, but he was way up on the pedestal, way better than I could ever become, and, um, and I thought that was one thing I'm never going to do. I'm never going to stand up and speak. And uh, it's interesting, so here this guy is standing up, and so what was it that was different about Peter? Very simply this, on the day of Pentecost, he had been filled with the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you, many of us in this room, and I think Peter had the person of the Holy Spirit, had the life of Christ within him. He had been with Christ for three years, but he had not before that time, had not received the power of the Holy Spirit. So he was transformed by the Holy Spirit. Now, let's ask the question, how did... The Spirit of God transformed Peter. And so let's look through this and see if we have some. And I like the way that uh, Nathan did it last week. He said, what's the evidence of this transformation? And so we begin with verse 22. And, and we read in verse uh, 22 through 24. Read this with me or listen to it. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God, set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, you put him to death. That's pretty bold, don't you think? Calling the people you're talking to on the carpet. Says, now, you guys are responsible for putting him on the, on the cross. And, uh, but God raised him up from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to, uh, uh, to keep its hold on him. Well, the first thing we notice up there is the fact that he is bold and confident witness for Christ. I got a feeling if I was to ask you, how many of you wish, if you could, that you would have more boldness in sharing Christ and have more ability to stand up and share in a good way about Jesus? Well, this man was. He stood up. He was bold. You know, when he says, verse 22, men of Israel, listen to this. He's like, he commanded your attention. Listen to this. I've got something worth saying. So often we're a little ashamed or a little shy, aren't we, to share about our faith for whatever reason. And, uh, but not this Peter. He was very, very bold. And uh, not as before, when fear had kept him from standing up for Jesus, now he said, listen to me. You've got to hear what I've got to say. What a great place. Remember Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 up there. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall be my witnesses. Not you might be, but you will be my witnesses. One of the signs or the evidences of the Holy Spirit coming upon a person is there is a 
deep inner desire to want to share about Jesus. This is one of the greatest desires you have. And I admit that even to this day, I, I'd like to think of myself as someone who's received the Holy Spirit. I think at times I tend to leak. How about you? I mean, at times we just sense the power, the energy of the Spirit, and just a boldness to share. And then it's like, I'm a little scared. I've even gone and knocked on doors hoping the door wouldn't be opened. You know, have you ever had that situation? And, and, and even given an opportunity to speak. It's interesting that in Ephesians chapter 6, 19 and 20, Paul is talking about the, the, the gifts, uh, the sword, or not so much the sword, the armor of God, and talking about the idea of pray at all times in the Spirit. And he goes on in verse 19, he says, And pray on my behalf that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So when Peter was speaking, he wasn't just sort of speaking quietly and just a little bit. He was speaking boldly and confidently by the Spirit. Number two, he spoke with authority. He spoke with authority. And you say, well, where's our authority? Now, if I ask that question, and by looking that up there, what would you say is the basis of a Christian's authority? It is what? The Word of God. Exactly, the Bible. Very good. So we see here in verse 25 and uh, through 28, that's what those numbers are. He said, what are those numbers up there? 25. Those are verses in the passage that we're studying. So we start with verse 25. And David said about him, I am the Lord. Always I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope. Because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy Spirit undergo decay. You, will have, you have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. So he is quoting from Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think he was reading that? Do you think he pulled out his little Bible and said, let me read this from the Psalms? What do you think? Isn't it, wouldn't it be true to say it seems logical that he was actually quoting that from memory? He'd obviously at some point probably had memorized this, maybe sitting under the teaching of Jesus. Jesus had pointed this out to them. I don't know. We don't have any evidence of that. But what you do see, he spoke with authority. And one of the things, speaking of Billy Graham, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that gave him such authority, that gave him entrance to speak with many presidents, was because he always said three words. Do you remember what he used to always say? The Bible says. It wasn't his opinion. It wasn't anything else. The Bible says. I want to just reemphasize to all of you in this room that the Word of God is still the Word of God. And according to the testimony of God and of Jesus Christ, this book will remain through the end of human history. According to this book, the book of Revelation, there is coming an end of human history at one point. Before that will happen, Jesus Christ will come back to the earth. Already so much has happened that has been written in this book. This is the Word of God. This is our only authority. Your accumulations, science, or whatever we want to say, historical books, this is the authority of God. This is your authority. When you speak, here is what the Word of God is. If you're going to lead someone to Christ, you need to lead them to Christ using the Word of God. And I tell you, one of the things that would give you and I more and more authority is if we have the practice of meditating and memorizing the written Word of God. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance what I've said to you. What Jesus said was the Word of God, wasn't it? And so, He can only bring to your remembrance what has been put into your memory. It's tough for some, many of us today, and many brothers and sisters in the body of Christ are having struggle even to read the Word of God, let alone take a few moments every week to memorize the Word of God. And you know, there's three steps to memorization. You know what they are? The first one is called repeat. The second one is called repeat. Do you have any idea what the third one is? Hey, there we go. And it helps to write it down, things like that. But when you come across a verse... They just said, you know, and, and sometimes when you're reading the Word of God and the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, because the Holy Spirit's your speaker, I mean, he's your teacher, he's your speaker too, he's your teacher, you'll be reading that, and have you had the situation, that's a neat verse. Have you been reading these? Oh, that's, that's a neat verse, that speaks to my heart. And what you should do in that situation, write it down, and begin to commit it to memory. I've been working on the verse for uh, 
VBS there. And I should be able to quote it, but I'm not quite there yet. I should be ready by tomorrow. And it says, but, uh, you know, I'm wanting to. I'm stirring it. But I, I, I personally, and I only share this with you because this week I'm going to share a couple things that I do. Because as I was studying Colossians and, and Philippians this week in my devotions, the Bible said that Paul said, basically he wrote there, he says, I have been an example for you. I have never asked you to do anything that I myself haven't done, and now you yourselves do. Now, I'm going to share sometimes things that I do. I am not by any means Jesus, all right? You got that down. If you all figure that out, yeah, Philip's not Jesus. Okay, I'm not perfect. And, uh, but the thing is, I, I followed the example of my father. And I tell you, it's, it's one thing to follow Jesus, and indeed we should, and to follow him. But, you know, sometimes we need Jesus on the earth, someone to follow. Well, what do they do? And over the years, I have been inspired and encouraged as I've heard, what do other people do to keep them strong in their faith? And one of the things that God has given me to do after accepting Jesus into my Lord, as my Lord and Savior in my heart, as I began to develop the discipline of reading the Word of God every day, the Lord put it on my heart through particularly the exhortation of other teachers and the example of other teachers to begin to memorize Scripture. And so it was easy when I could get up and say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, you've got that verse down. you got that down. You can be an evangelist. You can share that with people. Do you mind if I share a verse from the Scriptures with you? It's interesting, particularly, uh, particularly among the younger generation today, that the Bible is being attacked. I'm teaching this semester, uh, uh, not this semester, actually this month, at Friends University, and I have 12 students and in this summer class, and I asked them, do you think that the Bible is under attack today? Do you think that the, the, the Bible is losing credibility? And to uh, complete across every single person in the class said yes, particularly among our generation. There is a very subtle attack that you cannot trust the Bible. We've had discussions, I've had discussions even recently with people who at one point had a very strong faith, but now because of science and a lot of skepticism with regard to particularly the Old Testament, suggesting if this is a God who, who commits genocide, who, and it goes through some of the things that seem to give a bad report about God, particularly the God of the Old Testament, and there's tremendous distortion it's happening to try to undermine the credibility of the Word of God. But the Word of God is true. Let every man be a liar. But the Word of God is true. I would tell you a verse, for instance, that changed my life. And I read it one time. It's, it's found in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10. And, it, and sometimes, do you ever struggle with self-image? I, I feel like I'm not worthy or I cannot be used by God or I've done so many things wrong or whatever you might have. And 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10 said this, For by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Another verse that, you know, I quoted is Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10 says, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Well, I could go on to various verses. I've memorized many verses about marriage, hoping that would make me a better husband. I memorized many verses about raising children because I knew that was a concern. I've memorized a whole set of verses about fear and about courage because I can get afraid. Can you get afraid sometimes? I've memorized many verses about anxiety because I struggled with anxiety over the years. So the thing that gave Peter authority was that he quoted the Word of God. He knew the Word of God and he quoted from the Psalms and I might add some of the best Best memorizing is in the book of Psalms. Um, number three, he expounded the word of God accurately. And we go on from there and he, he says, look, I, I want to tell you, brothers, verse 29, he says, I can tell you confidently. Isn't that a great statement? I can tell you confidently. My prayer is that every one of us in this room, when empowered by the Holy Spirit, when you speak, you can speak confidently. I hope I'm coming across that way today, speaking confidently, not cautiously. And today, we have to be wise in how we speak. But he expounded the word of God accurately. He says, brothers, I can tell you, verse 29, I tell you confidently, the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. 
He's basically telling them, I want you to think about the scriptures. Think about it with me. But he was, but he was a prophet and knew that God had promised with an oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing that he was, uh, seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. You say, Peter, where are you coming up with this stuff? And this is what the Holy Spirit had taught him, or perhaps Jesus himself had taught him. That he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body undergo decay. But God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses to the fact, exalted to the right hand of God, and has received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. So he expounded the word of God very, very accurately. He used scripture to interpret scripture. Psalm 16, verses 8 through 11, and then he comes out later and he says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for my feet. That's Psalm 110, verse 1. So he used two different scriptures and said, you see how these confirm each other. And let me tell you, folks, that's good preaching. That's good preaching. And say, this is what the scripture says, this is what the scripture says. All right, so we can see that Peter certainly transformed into a preacher. And if, I have a, if I'd have a big desire... I would have a desire for all of you, or at least 50% of you, or at least 25% of you, all have the confidence to get up and preach. Can you imagine if I said, come on up here, Max, and preach, just, just for five or ten minutes. I mean, if I threaten Max to do that, he says, well, it's going to be a very short sermon. <laughs> you know? But that's my desire. And let me tell you, I do not believe, and let me, I want to say this very clearly. Did this Peter have a seminary education? No, he didn't. He certainly had an education for three years or so under Jesus. But let me say to you, if God has given you a calling to preach the word of God, you will be able to do it. I might add, I don't think it's limited to men. I think my wife, for one, and Megan's been up here. Different people can speak the word of God with boldness, male or female. Now, women shouldn't necessarily operate under, you know, with authority over men. But they can certainly speak with authority if they use the Word of God, the written Word of God. And God can raise up many speakers. I mean, there may come a time where I don't, I'm just once or twice a month, you know, or, or less, once every other month because I've got too many good preachers up here. And you might come to here on Sunday morning and, and uh, you say, well, I don't know who's going to speak today, but whoever they are, they're always good. You know, I would go to a service at Old Roberts University on Sunday nights. It was called Vespers. It started off with just a small group about the size of this group right here in this section. Just 30 or so people. And it was, a, it was just we had worship. It was led by the students. And then a student would get up and speak. It was meant to be just student. We didn't know who it was. And then the next week there'd be someone else. I never knew who was going to speak. But I tell you what, the atmosphere was to such a degree that whatever they said was just fantastic. Someone could get up there. And by the way, that 32 people or 30 or so people grew to over 600 people gathering every Sunday night. In fact, it was a secret desire in my heart. I hope I get to ask and speak there one time because it was the kind of atmosphere that was so exciting. Someone could get up and say, Jesus loves you. And everyone would go, yay, you know, like, you know, say basically nothing, but everyone would get really excited about it, you know. And it's just because it was as if the atmosphere was there. Um, so, you know, that's, and I think it's God's will. Might I say it is God's will for some of you to go from sitting in a pew listening to the time when you stand up and you're teaching the Word of God. You're speaking the Word of God with boldness. Don't say, that'll never be me. That'd be, that's what I did. And here we are. So, let's talk about the message of an empowered disciple. Just say, well, what did he preach? And I want to point out something that the first thing we notice about it, he didn't say, now I want to tell you what Jesus has done in my life. Now there's, there's a place for that. But he says, I want to tell you about Jesus. Notice also, he didn't talk about God. And I want to encourage you more and more, you know, what is God? God is a name given to many deities. Isn't that true? Many people address God, but they, they might mean someone different than you are. But let me tell you, when you begin to talk about Jesus, suddenly it all gets quiet. That's specific. And so he talked about Jesus, and I, I pray that the name of Jesus is easy on your lips. Not as a cuss word. To use the name of the Lord in vain is blasphemy. 
of which many people who are not Christians do. Be very careful even when you flippantly say, oh my God, and you're not praying those words. That is using the name of the Lord your God in vain. But And don't use Jesus Christ. Jesus is a name which is above every name. That at the name of, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess the name of Jesus. Jesus. Who is this Jesus? So let's talk about him. And so he goes through, and I, I will show you very quickly that this is what did he talk about? He talked about his humanity, that Jesus was real. First of all, he was a real human being, and that's a good thing to ask when you're talking to people. Do you believe Jesus was real, historical person? And he says, men of Israel, this Jesus of Nazareth, he came from a place called Nazareth. He was a man. Isn't it interesting? He was a man accredited by God. You say, how do you know he was from God? And he was all of man and all of God. He was born of a virgin. It's interesting talking to the students about that. you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? His biological father was God, the Father. He was a man, his humanity, his humanity and his divinity, and he was confirmed by God. How was he confirmed by God? How did you know he was from God? How did you know he was God? He could do signs and miracles and wonders. Do you want to be like this Jesus? <laughs> do you know what your number one goal in life is after you've become born again? I should ask my group from Wednesday night. What's the number one goal when you have been born again? What's your desire? What's your passion? What do you desire to see happen? Is it to see the world one to Christ? Sure, that's good. But let me tell you, the number one thing that should is the most important purpose of your life is to be conformed to the image of Christ, to be like Jesus. You say, I, I would love anything to be exactly like Jesus, to speak like Jesus, to preach like Jesus, to lay hands on the sick and see them get healed, to be able to walk up to someone and cast the evil spirits out. We have people even associated with this congregation that deal and struggle with evil spirits. That's what it is. So we talk about his humanity and his divinity. He went on from there and talked about his crucifixion. This man was handed over to you by God, set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, you put him to death, nailing him to a cross. They talked about his resurrection, but God raised him up from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. When was the last time you had a chance to talk to someone about the death and the resurrection of Jesus? He goes on from there and he talks about his exaltation. He says, look... Uh, David said of him, I saw the Lord always before me. And I'm not going to quote that. But uh, we come on down there and we find that uh, verse 32, he says, God has raised this Jesus to life and we're all witness of the fact. He's exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out that which you now see and hear, which leads us to the fifth one, his impartation. The Lord wants to give you and has poured out his Holy Spirit. And so this, this waterfall has been turned on. So that's the message. The message is someone who is filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, is the message about Jesus. So we come to the, the last point here. And the, well, what's the evidence of an empowered disciple? How do you know if someone is really empowered and has the power of the Spirit um, on them and in them? Well, first of all, there is the ability and the confidence to stand up and speak out. It's the ability and confidence to stand up and to speak out. And this is what we're looking for, and this is what God wants to do in terms of raising up people in the 21st century. If he can transform a, a man who, who tried like crazy to follow Jesus and blew it. And there's a good chance that some of you in this room say, one of the things that, um, no, I'm going to, that's another point coming up. I'm going to pull myself back there. The ability and the confidence to stand up and speak out. Now, might I add, in my own experience, I am not one to embrace opportunity. If I was to say to Steve down here, Steve does a beautiful job playing the guitar. In fact, sometimes we hide behind the guitar. But I say, in two weeks, Steve, would you be willing to get up here 
and uh, you can take this passage on the book of Acts. And how would you feel about that and speak? That's not rhetorical. <laughs> He's looking at me. Would, the deer in the headlights. Would you like to do it, Imani? Would you like to get up and share from the Bible? No, he's a little shy. So it's, even hard to, it's hard when someone's talking like this because I'm not supposed to do this. The thing is, the truth of the matter is, it, it, you're, it's, it's a little scary to get up and stand before a group of people and to speak out and to share. I remember the first time I was asked while I was a youth group in a singing group, and they said, would you like to get up and introduce the next song? And I was like, that was deer in the headlights. Like, I remember the first time in a group that I was asked to share my testimony. I was probably in, in high school, grade school. No, I was older than grade school. I must have been middle school. And I was just in a group, just a small group. And they said, Philip, why don't you share how Jesus became the Savior of your life, the Lord of your life? I remember my first response, I started crying. I couldn't. I was so nervous and so overwhelmed with emotion. And so, but I have to say that once the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you have to take a risk. If you know, I would like you to think about getting up and praying over a box, that's a great step forward in the right direction. It might be that you get up here and you do a devotion or in terms of preparation for communion. But there may come a point where God gives you an opportunity to speak out on behalf of Jesus Christ. And sometimes what there has to be a willingness to say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do. I believe you're in, inside of me. I believe you've empowered me. I'm willing to give it a, a shot. I'm willing to do that. And so that's the first thing is the ability and the confidence to stand up and speak out. Number two, there is a deep hunger to study, memorize, meditate on the written word of God that the Holy Spirit can bring to a person's remembrance when they speak. In other words, the word of God is the fuel for your fire. It is, in a sense, the provision for power. It's a source for your speaking. And so if there's a possibility that God wants to use me, then it's important for you to be in the Word of God seven days a week. It's important for you to be in the Word of God, period. I believe for every follower of Jesus Christ, the most important thing you can do with your day, with your time, above everything else, we would confess honestly that Jesus is more important than our job. But functionally, that's not true. Oftentimes your boss can say, would you get up and be here at four in the morning? And you know what you would do? You would be there at four in the morning because your boss told you to be. But I want to tell you, as a born-again believer who is filled with the Holy Spirit, you have a new boss. He is a boss higher than your boss at work. And if he says, get up 30 minutes or an hour before you get up to say, because I want to spend time with you, I want to love you, I want to talk to you, I want to teach you, oftentimes says, sorry, too tired, don't have the time. We try to fit little time in sometimes over the lunch break or on our way to work. But we don't treat our boss at work that way. And so if you're going to be serious about following Jesus Christ, you've got to be serious about the written word of God. Now, what am I holding in my hand? The Lord told me to bring my folders today. He says, what's your folders? Well, I take notes every day on, on what uh, I read the chapter and I take notes. And over the years, now this is something I do. My thing is find something that works for you and you're welcome to imitate me if you want to. As I say, my practices are better than the ones you don't have. All right? So here we go. So in this one, this is the, a folder on the book of Colossians. And in there, I just have each chapter that I did over these last... And I just write it down. And then I, I fold... That's what I do. I do it on the computer and print it out. But I encourage you that the most important thing you do with your day is not go to the grocery store is not go and earn a living. It is not washing your body. It is not brushing your teeth. It is not serving your wife or serving your husband. The most important thing you can do is spend time in the presence, the holy presence of God. And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you can't wait to do it. You're like someone who is a pizza addict that just got to have a pizza. You're like someone who is addicted in some ways to beer. You must have a drink. I confess, I admit to you, I am an addict of the Word of God. If I have a 6 o'clock appointment, I will be up at 4. You know what that means? I do have to go to bed at 9. And some of you got some weird shifts. 
don't you? Weird shifts. What do you do? You compensate for that. Because you hunger for the Word of God. You have a passion for it. Do not say, Lord, fill me with your spirit, but not willing to do the work that fuels you so the spirit can use you. Don't ask for the power of the spirit if you're not willing to provide the fuel that he can use. Are you with me on that? Do I hear an amen? You look quiet on me. You cannot do worldly stuff and expect spiritual results. There is a cost to following Jesus Christ. It is costly. It costs you in your time. It, by faith you give the first of all your income because you believe God will bless the rest of it. By faith you give the first of every day. And no matter what it is, nothing is greater than my job. In America, we honor our money. We honor our job. There comes a point we need to recognize that is idolatry. That is idolatry. When your job is more important, when money is more important than your love for Jesus Christ, you are not yet filled with, empowered by the Holy Spirit. And it's sometimes the things that you and I need to do is start admitting where we are not so we can become what he wants us to become. Do not just think because I come to church. Do not think because I just do this or that. I am set. I am filled if there's no evidence. What's the evidence of someone who is filled with the Spirit? Number one, a desire for opportunity to speak the Word of God. A willingness, I'll give it a shot. I'm willing to stand up and share about Jesus. Even if I mumble around and struggle, I'll give it a shot. As you pray and you find yourself growing in your passion for the people at work, I'm going to go share a verse with them. I'm going to walk down the block and knock on the door. I'm going to go to this meeting. I'm going to make a radical commitment to get up early in the morning. I'm going to give at least 30 minutes to the Lord and, and learn how to do it. Number, and the final thing is, that's the evidence I believe we see, particularly in the life of Peter, and we want to see it in the lives of ourselves, is a willingness to let the Holy Spirit totally remake the disciple into a whole new person. Are you willing to let the Lord transform you from what you are today to become what you probably maybe have never imagined you could become? Totally changed. We're not talking about self-help here, folks. We're talking about spiritual transformation. You cannot follow Christ and stay the same as you are. If you say, oh no, I'm going to follow Christ, but I like the way I am, just the way it is. I don't plan to do anything risky. Notice I put up there, who is willing to risk it all for Christ. We're so afraid even to risk looking stupid. We're so afraid. We're driven by fear of our peers. We're driven, you know, by fear to sometimes be honest and try something new and different. You cannot follow Christ and not be willing to. To die for your faith. If you want to say faith, you're following the wrong master. I'm just not hearing a lot of amens out of you guys here. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> I want to do that. Listen, listen very carefully. Look, a person who lets go of his past failures and sins, who holds no grudges, has no fears that his or her past will come back against them. They are willing to risk everything, even their own lives, for the sake of Christ. Do you remember those people that were standing out there? Was Peter taking a risk? Do you realize these are the same people that put Jesus on the cross? What would stop them from all saying, ah, and running and getting him and stoning him to death? By the way, did they do that to someone a few weeks, months later? Sure did. Stephen. See, when, when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you, He will change you if you let Him. But He will not change you if you don't let Him. If you don't take the medication, if you will, and some of you understand this, you won't get better. The Word of God, by the way, is the best medication you can ever get. You know, in the book of Proverbs, this is medicine for your soul. It's powerful stuff. So, 
Oh, by the way, Peter would die. He would, take, he would die the same death that Jesus died. Do you remember that story? You know, traditionally that he was to be crucified by the Romans. And he says, it's not worthy that I suffer like my master. And he asked to be crucified upside down. But he did die. And that's a tough question. When Jesus bids us follow him, he bids us come and die. See, Jesus never promised pleasure. You know what he promised, don't you? Tribulation. Difficulty. And he gave us the power to go through those difficult situations. So listen, dear friends. When the Holy Spirit comes upon a disciple and desires, who desires and allows him to take over and be changed, and can I tell you, I think that's a lifelong process. <laughs> you will not be the same again. Do you know 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17? It says, if any man or woman is in Christ, they are a what? A new creation. The old things have passed away. The old new things have come. I, I, I just want to say this. I believe by the Spirit of God, it is time for some of you to let go of some of your old things. Would you begin to say right now, Lord, is there anyone in my life that I'm holding a grudge against? Is there anyone that has hurt me so deeply I will never forget them and I certainly will never forgive them? Then my challenge to you, if you do not forgive men their sins, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your sins. And again, the power of the Holy Spirit is nullified if you hold unforgiveness in your heart. You must let it go. The other thing you've got to let go of, you've got to let go of the things that you've done. The things that you have done wrong. As if, well, I've done too much wrong. I've been married three times. I've done this. I, you know, I struggle with this. I struggle with that. There comes a point that says, enough. If the Lord wants you to do it, he's forgiven you of your sins. By virtue of the fact that every one of you are sitting in this room, you have not committed the unpardonable sin. Or you wouldn't be here. And I'll tell you, there's nothing in your past that can keep you from being used in a mighty way for God, for Jesus Christ. How about the Apostle Paul? Remember, we got up and even saying his own testimony. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. Why? Does he remember why he said that? Yeah, because I persecuted the church. I killed, I have the reputation of killing the first Christian. That was me. And yet he was the one who wrote most of the New Testament. He was used by God. And here's the word of God to every one of you in this room. God can use you if you let him. But if you say, no thanks, Lord, I just want to learn about you. I want to be sure I get to heaven, but I'm not sure I want to be used on this earth. That if God says, John, I have called you one day, you're going to be an evangelist for me. You're going to be speaking to people, possibly crowds of 2,000 people. And he puts it in and says, are you kidding me? That he can do that. The things that I do, said Jesus, you shall also do. And what else did he say? And greater things than these shall you do because I go to the Father. How are you going to do the things that Jesus did? You need a fresh personality. You need a personality to come inside of you and transform you. It's one thing you've got to accept Jesus Christ, but then you've got to yield to his spirit to come in and fill you and anoint you and overwhelm you at times and cause you to do what you're watching me do. <laughs> But do it better than me, for crying out loud. That's a joy that I, I look for the day when God's going to raise up people that do preaching and teaching well. I'd love to tell you about John and Janet. These are people that I knew back in the 80s. About Jeff. Jeff, who was in my youth group. Jeff was uh, five foot four by five foot four. Does that make sense? <laughs> He was a little, little guy. He was a little guy. He got the back of my motorcycle when I was in the, in the youth ministry. And uh, unfortunately, I didn't have my balance, and down we went. So, uh, but Jeff went on to be a youth pastor. He's led many young people to Christ. I could tell you about Eric Wooding. I could tell you about different people who were radically transformed by the person, the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to say to you simply this. Do not be afraid to change. Do not be afraid to risk. Do not be afraid to believe. To pray for, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if you're concerned about all that, please research it yourself. 
do not be someone that is limited to only what you hear other preachers or teachers say. You'd be someone that gets to the place where you can research what is the truth. I write scriptures up on this overhead so you can take them home and see if this is true. Is this baptism of the Holy Spirit? Is this empowering by the Holy Spirit a true thing? Is this something God has more for you than you can ever imagine? The answer is absolutely yes. Can he do miracles in your life? Absolutely. Can he set you free from anxiety? Can he set you free from fears? Can he set you free from the, the guilt of the past? All of those things are absolutely true. Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. There was a song, and I was looking it up, and it says, I'll never be the same again, oh no. And have you ever heard that song before? That goes way back into the 70s. I'll never be the same again, oh no. Since I met the Lord, I'll not be the same. I'll never be the same again. I looked that up, and I came across this song by Darlene Check that's a whole lot better than that one. And I've asked the worship team, you don't have to worry about coming up here, so I want us to put that song up there. I just want you to listen to this song and just let this soak. If you think you know it, you might have heard it. You're welcome to sing along with it, but just relax and just let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Go ahead and put that video on there if we can.